Today we're going old school, talking about the asynchronous serial protocol. Why you ask? Well, it may turn out that your employer has some equipment that's a little older than you think. It's been around since the early 1960s and it still is a great way to easily and quickly connect two machines. It is called asynchronous serial protocol. Now, first of all, let's talk about this word asynchronous. No clock. Now, a lot of the time, well, all the time, if I am a device that's receiving bits, I have to know exactly when each bit is coming. Now, the easiest way to make sure you know when each bit is coming is to add a clock so that you have a, a, a signal that says, read it now, read it now, read it now, read it now. The problem is, is that clock adds an additional line, an additional wire. And whenever you're talking about long distances, these long wires get heavier. They add, they're more expensive because they have more copper in them and so forth. So if we can send something with just a single wire in one direction and another wire going in the other direction coming back to us, that'll make things a little bit more efficient at least in terms of material. Now, serial, we've already talked about it, one bit at a time. One bit at a time. Now, you may think, and rightly so, that I can send more data quickly if I'm sending multiple bits in parallel. We've got the same problem, heavier, larger cables, larger connectors. Whenever you're talking about sending eight bits at a time, that's eight wires, and a physical connector starts getting bigger and bigger. Also, in you, if you start sending bits in parallel at high frequencies, you get something called crosstalk. I've got two antennas, one that's broadcasting and one that's receiving. In fact, that one that's receiving is also broadcasting back to the one that was sending. So you've got all this potential for, for data corruption by having this thing called crosstalk. So it turns out serial is really a very effective way, an important way, to transmit data. And what about a protocol? Well, protocol basically means rules. Things that define exactly how I'm going to communicate between two devices, because if we're not speaking the same language, we're not going to understand each other. So, what do we have? Well, we've got two devices. And in the old days, these devices were referred to as data terminal equipment. otherwise known as DTE, and data communications equipment. DCE. Now, this was an important distinction because it defined things like pins and so forth. But in general, at a minimum, you need to have three pins. You need to have a transmit, that is abbreviated TX, sometimes you see it abbreviated TD for transmit data, that is going in a single wire to a receive, RX or RD, on a receiving device. And that'll give us one-way data. The other direction, you need to have a similar transmit coming from the data communications equipment to receive on the data terminal equipment. So there's two wires. What about the third wire? Well, understand that these two devices may be quite distant from each other. And so the relative voltage levels of what they consider a reference or a ground may be different. So we also need to send something that I'm gonna abbreviate with GND here. It is a reference ground. Now, typically, you'll see this actually as an SG for signal ground because it's being used as a reference for those, those bits being transmitted and received between the two devices. Now, one of the protocols back in 1961-62 was referred to as RS-232. Now, the RS, uh, I think it's recommended standard, S I know stands for standard, 232 is a standard that defined exactly how electronically and data-wise we were going to implement this asynchronous serial protocol.
And what it said was that I am going to send a logic zero by using a voltage level that is positive, anywhere from a positive three volts up to a positive 15 volts. And a logic zero, excuse me, a logic one, will be anywhere from a negative three volts to a negative 15 volts. And so what you have is this reference ground. And if you get a voltage, if you're the receiver and you get a voltage that's above the reference, the reference, sig the signal ground, then you know that's supposed to be a logic zero. If you get a voltage that is below that reference, that signal ground, then you know that you're getting a, a logic one. And so as the distances went, so, so if you send voltages down a long wire, the farther you get, the, the more attenuated those voltages get, the closer they get to zero. But by making it so that those voltages are opposing, then you still have a good chance, even if you've had significant signal reduction by distance, you still have a good chance of, dis of distinguishing zeros from ones. Now, another important part of this protocol is that every single one of the bits is just sent as a single level. So you've got these times that you're sending a single bit. And you're going to send either a high voltage or a low voltage. Now these high and low voltages, they are going to stay that level for exactly one bit time. Which means that the signal changes at the same rate that the bits are coming. In other words, I can have this signal changing back and forth to represent different v levels, voltage levels, at say 9,600 times a second. Well, that corresponds to 9,600 bits being sent per second. So what we have is something called a baud rate. Now, a baud rate represents the rate at which signals can change, the speed at which the signal levels can change. In the case of asynchronous serial protocols, this also equals our bit rate. In other words, since every signal level identifies a bit, in other words, the minimum time that you can have a signal be a certain level, also equates to a single bit, then our baud rate and our bit rate are exactly the same, all right? Now, it is possible to have data terminal equipment communicating with data terminal equipment. In that case, you've got a slightly different arrangement of these connections. So in that case, what you've got is the TX, and the RX being on the same position of the, as the connector. That means that I would have two devices transmitting on the same wire and two devices receiving or listening to the same wire. That means or makes it so that we should have a device, a special cable that swaps those lines. Sometimes you've heard this called a crossover cable, but in general, this is referred to as a null modem. And a null modem allows data terminal equipment to communicate with data terminal equipment. In addition, there are some other lines that may exist. They're not required, in fact, rarely used, but the old standard does define or allow for additional signals. These include something like DCD, which is a data carrier detect, uh, DTR, which is a data terminal ready. Uh, let's see, how about RTS, ready to send, CTS, clear to send, DSR, data set ready, uh, RI, ring indicator. Now, I'm not going into any detail in here, but if you are experiencing some sort of problem with getting two older devices to communicate, old devices sometimes use these additional signals for handshaking. In other words, clear to send would mean, yes, I'm ready to receive, a, receive something. Ready to send means I'm ready to send you something. All of these signals are important in some of these old style asynchronous serial communication systems.
Now, if you've done any work with networking, you've probably been introduced to something like the ISO seven layer model. And the deeper you get in that model, the closer you get to talking about something called a frame. Now, a frame is basically a unit uh, that, we, that we put together in order to transmit a group of bits or some data from one device to another device. The RS-232, or excuse me, the asynchronous serial protocol frame is pretty simple. It's also pretty small. Let's divide up our board here in some of these bit times. Okay, so I've got a bunch of these bit times, and in it, as time passes, I'm going to send data. Now, there are some important things to remember. First of all, our data is seven or eight bits. We basically can send a character, a byte. All right. Now, oftentimes, you most likely you see these connections done with eight bits. But in the older style, if you've if you've gone through the lesson on ASCII, you know that original ASCII was only seven bits, and so oftentimes you would send just ASCII characters along with seven bits. But most of the devices we see nowadays are set up to transmit data as eight bits. That is all a frame can contain is just one byte. That's it. Now, before a frame can get started, we have idle. Now, idle is just a constant logic one. Note that my diagram here is not voltage levels, it's logic levels. So what we've got is a logic one. A constant logic one just means nothing's being sent. When a device wants to send information, it sends a single bit of a logic zero. That logic zero is referred to as a start bit. And what it does is it synchronizes the receiving device. It says, okay, this falling edge right here corresponds to the beginning of a bit time. Now, before these two devices can even send the first byte, they have to agree on the bit rate. All right, right up front, whoever's configuring the transmitting device or the DTE equipment, whoever's configuring the other device, they have to agree we're communicating at, I don't know, how about 9,600 bits per second. So they have to agree on it. By agreeing on it, they know that exactly half a bit time after I receive that falling first falling edge, that's going to be the middle of a bit period. And if I keep reading at the middle of a bit period, I should get the sequence of ones and zeros that defines this frame. Once this single start bit passes, though, I can send my data. Let's go ahead and assume I am sending eight bits. So the next eight bit times, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, this is my data. All right. Now, typically, this data is sent least significant bit first. If you've gone back in any of these lessons, you've probably heard of something called Indianness. In other words, am I sending the most significant bit first or the least significant bit first? Vast majority, always least significant bit first, but if you do decide to go another way, both devices have to agree which one are we sending first, most significant or least significant. So let's just put some data in here. How about uh, maybe we've got a hexadecimal C9, which in binary is 11001001, and least significant bit is that one right there. So we would send a one followed by two zeros, followed by a one, followed by two more zeros, and then followed by two ones. So there is our data sent along this asynchronous connection. Now, once we have tr finished transmitting this data, we've got another bit to worry about, or actually there are a couple that we might worry about. Now, there is an optional bit. This optional bit is referred to as a parity bit. Once again, we have to agree up front. So all of these things are things we need to agree on, uh, on before we can do the first bit of communication, we have to agree on these items. The number of data bits, the baud, the, the baud rate or bit rate, the Indianness. we also need to agree on parity. And there are four kinds, actually 
there are five settings, but we'll talk about all five of them. There's odd, even, mark, space, and none. All right, so there are all the types of parity we could have. Now, none is probably the most common. In fact, if you've ever seen the, um, the definition of a communication along asynchronous, uh, you, you've probably seen something like 8N1. 8 being 8 bits, N meaning no parity, 1 meaning a stop bit. We'll talk about that in a minute. But let's go ahead and assume that I am going to send odd parity. Like I said, this is not common, but let's assume that we are sending odd parity. What odd parity says is that if I count all the ones in the data and the parity bit, the result has to be odd. So I've got one, two, three, four bits that are ones in my data. That means for odd parity to work, my odd, par my odd parity bit has to be a one also, giving me a total of one, two, three, four, five bits that are ones. This is used for kind of simple error checking, but typically what we do is we actually send our error detection information along as part of the data and not necessarily checking each frame of the asynchronous communication. Even parity says that my parity, if this was, if this was supposed to be an even parity bit, that means that that parity bit would be a one, two, three, four. It would have to be a zero for me to have an even number of ones in the data and the parity bit. Mark, always a one. Space, always a zero. It's kind of just a way to close up, wrap up the frame. All right. And at the very end over here, we have our stop bits. And I put bits with the S in parentheses, meaning that there could be one, there could be one and a half, and there could be two stop bits. So we have to also agree on the number of stop bits as one, one and a half, or two. And that's really all we need to agree on. Once we've agreed on that, there's our frame. Now, something I want you to catch, uh, take a look at, let's, let's also, you know, I said that there was this thing of 8N1, which is shorthand for defining some of these characteristics we have to agree on up front. For example, eight bits, no parity, one stop bit. Now, if I have an 8N1, how many frame bits do I have? Well, the total frame bits have to include the start bit, they have to include the data, and they have to include the stop bit and any parity that we might have. So if I have 8N1, that means I've got eight data bits, one stop bit, a start bit, that's, that's nine bits, one stop bit, that's 10 bits. So with a minimum kind of, of, of configuration like 8N1, you're looking at 10 frame bits to send eight data bits. And so when you're looking at your efficiency of the frame, it's eight divided by 10, which is equal to 80%. In other words, of all the bits we send, only 80% of them are actually data. Not really very efficient, but it's really meant for control, simple control. Let me erase this and we'll talk a little bit more about rates. So let's talk about rates, data rates, bit rates. First of all, let's, let's list some standard bit rates or baud, right? Remember baud and bit rates in the case of asynchronous serial are the same thing. Now, some standard bit rates, and there are plenty of them, but some of them that you might have heard of are 2400, 4800, 9600, uh, 19, and we usually call it 19.2. And there's a lot of commas up there, aren't there? Um, but even could go up to 115 to 115,200 bits per second, all right? So those are some standard bit rates, but remember those bit rates include all the bits in the frame that we're sending. So if we're actually interested in the data bit rate, that's gonna be a little lower. The data bit rate is going to be the number of data bits divided by the number of frame bits times the bit rate. So 
if we're talking about a, 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 a an eight data bits being sent in a frame of 10 bits, so we had that 80% efficiency, right? Um, then what you're really looking at is taking any one of these, dividing it by 10, dropping off a zero. So for example, if we were talking 9,600, then this would be eight times 960, right? That would give you your data bit rate. But something that's sometimes sent, especially if we're sending just text, basically ASCII. Yes, we're limiting ourselves to ASCII at this point. Uh, we also have a measurement of characters per second. And in that case, each, each frame contains one byte or one character. And so typically that is just simply your bit rate divided by your number of frame bits. All right, so with something like a 9600 baud rate, what you're looking at is 960 characters per second. We go all the way up to 115,200 bits per second, then you're actually looking at 11,520 characters per second. Once again, this is pretty slow, but we're talking about things like, we're talking about controlling very simple things where we're not communicating with large blocks of data. Now this is a picture of a computer that I have, not so old. And if you can see, there's this weird little nine pin connector at the bottom of it. That thing's called a DB9. And the connector has nine pins and it is in the shape of a D. Now, each one of these nine pins is set up to perform part, one of the functions of this asynchronous serial communication. This pin right here, pin two, this is the receive. This pin right here, pin three, this is the transmit. Pin five over here at the end is our signal ground. All right. Now, the thing about this particular connector is that's all you really need in order to connect to this machine through its serial port. The, why is it there? Well, you know, there's a lot of legacy equipment out there. There's old manufacturing equipment that, once again, you're not transmitting large blocks of data. You just want to control or put, send configuration files to it. This little RS-232 connection is plenty. In fact, you can even connect to a Raspberry Pi. If you look at the upper corner of the Raspberry Pi, there's this header called the GPIO header. And a block of pins up here, these pins right here, uh, have the transmit, receive, and the signal ground available on that connector. Why on earth would the Raspberry Pi, a relatively new machine, a relatively new device, include an asynchronous serial port. A couple of reasons. Primary reason being that if you're running that Raspberry Pi without any sort of monitor or keyboard or mouse or interface, maybe it's not even connected to a network, you need to be able to access it to do configuration, to start applications and so forth. That'll give you connections to a terminal interface. Well, aren't there better ways to do this? Couldn't we do this through USB or something like, or Ethernet or something like that? Turns out that the silicon that is required in order to create this interface, really simple, doesn't take a whole lot of transistors. So why bother throwing it out? If it's gonna take so little logic in order to create this interface, might as well go ahead and include it. Old mice, old mi some of the old serial mice, they actually connect to this sort of a, of a configuration. Another thing is, though, is that it's very consistent. We know every machine that has a COM port has the same addressing to communicate with it. So there's no plug and play. You go from one device to the next device to the next device, you're always going to find the interface at exactly the same, uh, um, uh, inst at the exact same addresses. But one last thing before we wrap it up. You know, those voltage levels, they allow us to go pretty long distances. The standard says 50 feet. 50 feet is, is enough to get across the house and get across the building. Um, but if you lower the, the, the baud rate, you can actually go thousands of feet. That said, it is still a common protocol that you'll find out there, especially with that older equipment.